get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm going to introduce in a second Chris Peer of Sync Show. Before I do, Chris, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out. Um, I, you know, over the past 10 years, I've had some amazing guests on, um, you know, the founder of Atari, P90X, RX Bar, but I like hearing about maybe people that you know, aren't well known, their companies aren't well known. And there was one that I had on recently, um, Wes Matthews of high level marketing. He talks about how he grew his agency this over $6 million and then sold it. And he talks about the process of selling it. And it's just a really interesting interview. And uh, another friend, uh, Todd Tasky was helping him sell his agency and just na- hearing how to navigate that process was really interesting. So check out that and many other episodes. And um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we all businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And, you know, for me, Chris, people know like the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships. And I've found no better way to do that than to profile the people and companies I admire on my podcast and share their story with uh, the universe, the rest of the people out there. So if you are a business and you've thought about podcasting, you should, if you have questions, you can email us at rise25.com. We've been doing it for over a decade. So let us know. And I'm excited. You know, first of all, a big shout out to Scott Anderson of Double Dare Executive Coaching. The reason I am talking to Chris Peer and Sync Show today is Scott, I said, Scott, who is an amazing individual, amazing company I should have on? He said, Chris is your person. He's a must have on your podcast. Scott, if you don't know him, is an experienced executive coach. He's got, you know, he's an entrepreneur with over 30 years experience. He started over a half dozen companies himself. So he has been in the trenches and he also has a master's degree in clinical counseling. So he basically helps people get breakthroughs when they have plateaus personally or professionally. So if you have questions about that, you can go to Double Dare You dot us and and check them out and chris peer is the founder and owner of sync show which is a digital marketing firm specializing in sales and marketing success for manufacturers professional services transportation and logistic industries and chris i don't know what i how i would describe it is um you help companies to rethink their approach to sales marketing and help with rapid growth um that also you know focuses on the brand loyalty for the customers that they serve and you really serve high growth oriented companies. So Chris, thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. How did you meet Scott? How did you know Scott? You know, funny, uh, Scott reached out to me via LinkedIn hmm. and um, he said, Hey, I want to connect with you. I am a coach an executive coach for agency owners. And it, you know, I get a million LinkedIn and emails a day and it stuck <laughs> out to me. So I, I what called- stuck out? Why, why did that stick out? Highly specific, just very direct. You know, I mean, there's not a lot of coaches, executive coaches that focus just on agency owners. And um, so I called him immediately, talked to him, and um, he's been an, a fantastic executive coach. So I uh, can't say enough positive things about Scott and the experiences I've had with him. That's great. Yeah. We all need a coach. I mean, even like high performing athletes, they have coaches for nutrition and conditioning, like every aspect of their life. And so often we neglect that in ourselves sometimes, I guess. Right. Um, So talk a little bit about Sync Show and what you do. Sure. So uh, Sync Show is a marketing agency, as as you mentioned, Jeremy, and and you pretty much summed it up. (laughs) You nailed you nailed it. We work with high growth companies in only three verticals. Um, all business to business. And those verticals are transportation and logistics, uh, manufacturing and distribution, and the professional service firms that serve them. So like technology firms, accounting, um, legal, but the ones that really are looking to attract and work with transportation and manufacturing companies. Yeah. And what we do is we help them to identify their ideal customers, how to attract those customers, how to engage them, 
um, how to turn them into customers, and then also to foster customer loyalty um, to increase customer value and revenue for an organization. And we did that all through communications, um, everything from website development to inbound marketing to outbound account-based marketing and um, value proposition work. You know, Chris, you're a rare breed that has been doing this for almost a couple decades now. And, um, and I was watching a video of when you first started, I can't remember if it was in your basement or your attic or, or some small room. Um, when you first started, you made a conscious choice to niche at some point, right? So talk about that decision and, and what you were thinking at the time. That's a great question. Um, and that actually goes back to a previous coach I had years and years ago. Um, so when we first started doing work, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I mean, I was, I, I had been in the workforce for maybe 10 years working. I worked for a small design agency. Then I worked for American greetings, literally helping design greeting cards. And that's amazing. I, <laughs> uh, because that's your background, right? It was graphic design. Yeah, I was a graphic designer. Yeah. Um, but I always had the business side, business sense, and um, really wanted to start my own thing. So when we first started, we did work with anybody who would pay us um, and really was making it up as I went. And I had some very fortunate um, mistakes I made or you know, things that kind of fell in my lap, um, which allowed me to get out and network and hire and um, started growing the company. And then probably it wasn't until I was in business for 10 years that my coach said, you know what, if you really want to scale this thing, think about a niche. What are you really good at? And that's when we made the pivot. How did you choose that niche? I mean, so, it seems yeah. like there's kind of like a couple of verticals, but it, it, at the time it's, it's a difficult, it seems logical, but I think when you're doing it, anyone's doing it, it's like, well, then I'm giving away this other business and they're coming to me up to turn them away. So there is a downside to it. I mean, quote unquote downside, obviously, but um, how did you choose what you chose? Cause you probably could have gone in a bunch of different directions. Yeah. So, um, you know, there were other industries that we could have chosen that would have probably been more lucrative um, the technology industry, you know, working with law firms, you know, companies with a lot of money that invest a lot in marketing. But when it came down to it, we sat down and we said, who do we love working for? Who are the best clients? And at the time, this is back in 2012, um, about a third of our customers were, were middle market manufacturing companies. And what I loved about manufacturing was they were good people. If, if you could find the manufacturers that believed in marketing, they were really great. You had a seat at the table. They valued your services. They paid on time. And they're just good people. And they treated my staff really well. And so manufacturing was a logical fit. Um, several years later, we also started looking at... Um, the transportation industry. And what I realized it's it's, booming right now, you know, with, it's booming, you know, yeah. with, um, booming. you know, pandemic and e-commerce and everything like that too. So. And it sounds kind of corny, but you know, the one thing I love about it and I think where my passion plays in is without transportation and manufacturing, we don't have much of a company, a country, you know, we don't have a country that thrives and th those two industries employ a majority of our workforce. And so the more that we can help those, those industries, the more we help, you know, our communities. I mean, you're even a board member at one of the associations, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned um, mistakes. So there were some timely mistakes along the way that led you to where you are. What were you referring to? You know, I think there's a book out there called The E-Myth. Um, yeah, I've had Michael Gerber on the podcast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
I read that book years after I started the company. And what I realized was in the e-myth, he talks about, you know, the entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial myth and some of the recommendations, how you should hire somebody to replace you. And what I didn't realize I did within the first year of starting the business was a gal walked into, I had an office um, on the West side of Cleveland and we'd only been in business at this office for like six months. And this woman walked in and she said, I'm applying for a graphic design position. I said, I'm not hiring for one. How did you find us? Like, I don't even, I think we were brand new. And um, so she brought her portfolio and she just walked in and I'm like, well, I'm a sole entrepreneur. I'm like, but I'd love to see your portfolio. I'm a graphic designer. Her portfolio was amazing. And uh, her name was Jennifer. And um, she was my first in, my first employee, my first hire. I thought you were going to say she's now my wife or something. No, no. <laughs> okay. No, but um, what was ironic about that was I didn't know it at the time. And it was kind of like a, a fortuitous mistake. It allowed me to start doing, start running a business as opposed to being a graphic designer. Um, I wish I could say it was intentional, but it wasn't. But it really helped to start scaling the organization. Chris, what are some of the evolution of your services? So like, obviously I could see how you're, you know, designing greeting cards. So are you offering graphic design services? And then where, how do you evolve into these other services? Yeah, so you know, the, the marketing industry is evolving so quickly and it, especially over the last 20 years with digital and the internet and all the capabilities that it brings today. You know, when we first started out, we were primarily a corporate identity and branding company. That was my background. Um, I loved working with corporate identity and branding. Still do, but um, I don't do the design work anymore. As the internet became more and more prevalent, you know, we started building a lot more websites. And then, you know, as the technologies enhanced, the, the analytics and the data and the metrics became, you know, more and more important. And back in 2011, 2010 timeframe, I had a business partner up to that point. Um, I brought in a business partner about four, four years into starting the company. And then 2011, 2012, um, we decided to part ways. Uh, he's a great guy and he had a great vision. Just, it was a little different than mine and we, we were headed in different directions and he wanted to be more of a software tech company I wanted to be more of a service company. And it was at that point that we really started to morph as an organization and focus on uh, return on investment, analytics and data. And what was ironic about it was one of our largest clients at the time, um, who happened to be a relative of my business partner, we were doing their marketing and just built their website. And they had just landed a $20 million account in the automotive industry. Pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. And we knew the lead came from us. The, the, the website had generated the lead. And six months later, their VP of marketing quit and he replaced them and that VP fired us. And I remember saying, if we can't keep a family member, it was, a, it was my business partner's cousin, um, after getting them 20 million in revenue because we couldn't prove the lead came from us um, and make it discernible, then we're, we're screwed. So I said, we have like best to case scenario, right? Like family member, we get them a ton of business, right? And yeah, yeah. it's crazy. So, but eye opening. I'm like, if we can't prove it for this person and prove our, our value and our ROI, we got to do different. So that's when I really changed up the model and um, morphed to what it is today. What's really interesting, Chris, is um, I want to back up about bringing in a business partner. Um, and how do you navigate that? Because you're running the business and you don't have to like give me specifics, but I'm curious for anyone out there who's like thought about bringing someone in. What is a good way of navigating from like a structure standpoint? Does this person buy into the business and, and like, how does that, because I've hear this all the time. Like I I'm going to bring, I'm thinking of bringing in a business partner or what do you look for in that? And then how do you structure something like that? And I know everyone's going to be different, but I'm just curious from, you know, you've been through that before. If you were to do it now, 
what would you do? I wouldn't do it now. <laughs> Why is that? You know, I, when I brought in a business partner, he, he's a great guy and don't, this isn't not to disparage anybody. Um, I was a very fairly immature as a business owner. I mean, I'd only owned a business for four years. I really didn't have a lot of agency experience before starting with, I didn't know what I was doing. And to be quite frank, I was scared. I, I, I didn't have the confidence to run the business myself. And I thought by bringing in somebody else who shared a like interest, we could do it together and provide some comfort. Um, it, it was great for several years, but I, I wouldn't do it again. I just, I, I just, if I was going to bring in a strategic partner, it, it would definitely have to be for a very strong value reason. And while I am very interested in growing the organization and scaling it, um, I want to have fun doing it and be quite honest. I, I like being able to make the decisions and, and move. And sometimes a, a business partner can slow you down. Um, it is a marriage, you know I mean? It is. Whether or whatever you spell it. So it's got to be like a really good fit on, on many levels. And if you look at the divorce rate, <laughs> exactly, uh, it's going to fail most likely. So, uh, and I'm sure business partners are even a higher divorce rate. So, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It can have its benefits for sure, but I just, I don't think it's for me. Let's say you go cool. You find a perfect person for you, Chris. It's a perfect strategic partner. You're, you know, it fits in whatever need the business has. How would you structure that bringing someone else in? Well, I think it would depend on that person. Um, you know, I've got some very key members of my team now that I'm growing and will make into a partner level um, with minority shares. And I think that's, you know, to help them grow and, and to have, you know, some sort of a uh, exit strategy, you know, when I'm ready to make that exit, whenever that should be. Um, you know, and if, if between now and then another partner comes in, I guess when, when you say business partner, Jeremy, I'm, I'm, I was thinking more of like that majority minority, you know, 40, 50% owners where two people are, you know, always struggling for either strength or power or decision-making. I don't know if that answers your question, but that, you know, that. No, that does. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily have anything in my mind of what it means. It could mean whatever it is. I mean, maybe it means like you said, well, you know, it's really just someone who's gonna, they're not going to be like equal partners with you, but just come in and have some kind of equity stake, whatever that is. And I'm all for like, you know, I read the book, uh, who not how by Dan Sullivan. It's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome book. And I, I am a firm believer in it. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm all for sharing in the wealth. If somebody has that same passion and drive and adds value to the company, by all means, we have a phantom stock program here. And um, that is offered up to key personnel that um, share that same vision um, and prove themselves. So I guess you could call that a form of partnership. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, there's a couple things that um, we are talking about before we hit record, which is, you know, going digital um, and the things you do with digital, like account-based marketing, direct marketing. Talk about there is a transportation company that you had helped and talk about some of the things you did for them. Sure. So this was one of the, you had asked like for some case studies or some, you know, success stories. A couple of them really stood out to me. And, and one of them was a company that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's in the transportation industry um, at a billion in revenue, over a billion in revenue. And what I really got, got excited about with that particular account and that project was they were a very complex organization. They had grown through acquisition over many years, had multiple organizations. And what was interesting about it is when we got in and learned more about what their challenges for growth were, even though they were highly successful, super great people, like really nice people is still privately held. 
Um, what was interesting is there, as they acquired these companies over time, they competed against each other, even though they were operating under one umbrella. Um, so they had different sales teams, different marketing approaches, you know, different value propositions. So what I was really proud about is our team went in and we helped them to not only come together, but to establish one primary value proposition that positioned them as one organization with multiple services, as opposed to one corporate umbrella with multiple companies. And it helped to reduce the competition within, but also streamlined their lead flow and how they were getting leads and attracting people to their brand. We built a new website for them. Um, we helped with all their marketing, uh, helped them build out their value proposition and all their corporate messaging. And that's one of those projects where our team came together and I'm just really proud of the work we did with that organization. It, 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 it went really well and it served them really well. Yeah, I mean, when I look at what you do, you are, you know, essentially really helping people with an inbound marketing strategy and execution. What were some of the things that with this transportation um, that would be an example or you can talk in more detail about from like the inbound side of things? Yeah, so inbound is definitely a, a big piece of what we do, um, but inbound is changing. Um, so we're putting a greater and greater focus on multi-channel marketing with more direct marketing today. Um, what we're seeing in the industry, I'll answer your question in a moment, but what we're seeing in the industry uh, by and large is that, you know, for the last 10 years, content marketing and inbound marketing has been the big push. Now the internet's filled up with a lot of garbage and a lot of content that nobody wants to read. And so, um, you know, looking, it, there's, there's definitely still a very important piece of your marketing that needs to be inbound. But if you really want to drive the leads, you're going to need to take a multi-channel approach. Um, so to get back to your question with this particular company, uh, we did start with an inbound approach. And, and that approach started with getting their value proposition and their corporate messaging nailed down and solid. So we did competitive analysis and we really looked at how they were going to market and then how to position them differently. Once that was completed, we then did, built the website. And then once the website was completed, we started with search engine optimization and content marketing and advertising. And um, you know, we still work with uh, multiple divisions of that company. When you say direct to marketing, give me some examples. Like I always think of like sending direct mail, but I think that it's, it's obviously broader than that. What are some examples of when, when you're in your mind, when you say direct marketing, what does that mean to someone listening? Yeah. So when I, when I, when I look at, when you look at marketing and the main types of marketing, inbound marketing is really popular today. It's been for a while. And to some degree, that's a fishing approach. You're, you're, you're putting bait in the water, maybe some chum. And what you're trying to do is attract the people looking for your product or services. Um, but as traditional sales works, you know, sales would make outbound phone calls. They would, you know, do advertising and some of that is inbound or fishing, but you also need to go hunting sometimes. And oftentimes our clients have specific clients that they're trying to bring on, you know, maybe it's a specific number of clients within an industry or just a very targeted market. Um, it could be a geography or a company size or an industry, as I mentioned. So that would be what we call more direct marketing or account-based marketing. And in that particular case, you're trying to get, what we would do is get our customers' brands in front of real people, employees at those organizations. Um, ideally, their ideal customer profiles, which would be their specific buyers. Um, and build that trust over time so that they're more likely to get that win. Yeah. Of course, I'd love to hear some creative examples, either that you've seen or done. I love hearing these stories. Like I've heard people sending swords, people sending signed helmets of their favorite player. 
what have you seen or done that has been that got your creative juices flowing with sending out something direct to uh, a potential customer? So, you know, we, we really don't play in that space as far as like okay. the direct mail creative piece. Um, I recently joined uh, an agency mastermind group. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, you can see that box right behind me. Um, that was a really creative way to get me involved mm. in that group. The, the owner of, uh, of that group is Joey Gilkey is his name. I know Joey. Yeah. 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 So Joey's been on the podcast also. If you watch Joey's, one of my favorite interviews, because he played college football. So I clipped in some of his college football highlights oh, right. into yeah. the front of the interview on like ESPN or something like that. So anyways, yes, Joey, Joey is great at that. Totally. Yeah. So, I mean, I had just joined the group, but I wasn't expecting to get something in the mail. I get this customized box in the mail with a really nice bottle of bourbon and two etched, you know, bourbon glasses. You know, I think it's the, that was, that was something I, I was having a bad day that day. I got home and opened the mail. I was like, holy crap. This is <laughs> he's this just like, yeah. he's enabling a dr drinking. Like I had a bad day. Like, oh, I got a bottle of bourbon. Okay. <laughs> with some good bourbon too. So, um, you know, I think the other creative things that we've done, um, I can't say we've done something as cool as like a direct mail piece like that, but, um, we, we, we work more in a tactical way on social media and creating valuable messaging that will get in front of people yeah. and then delivering that into people's inboxes, whether it's through personal social outreach or email marketing, um, or, you know, maybe it could be a direct phone call. Yeah. Um, were there any, when you were, when going back to your American greeting days, were there any cards that you um, designed or that you saw that stuck out? Oh, geez. Because yeah, it's sort was... of like the same. I feel like it, it's sort of flexing a very similar muscle. Like what you did then is, you know, someone has to look at it like on a, sh of a sea of cards and you have to be like, oh, this is, and they have to pull it and they have to see it's the messaging has got to be on point enough to buy it, to give to, to a loved one. Right. So it, there's a lot of similarities there. You know, there, there are, I, I wish I was that sophisticated when I was 25 years old and, <laughs> you know, I'm 50 now. So that was 25 years ago, but greeting card uh, design and creation back then was it was an assembly line. Um, it was really amazing. They had 120 creative artists at American Greetings. It was like the second largest art studio in the world. Wow. Um, so somebody would literally design the illustration. We had painters and such, and then somebody would write the writing or the editorial. Um, I was one of the ones that would put it all together and get it ready for printing. It wasn't glamorous, but it was fun. Um, I learned a lot there. So um, did you did you bring some of those things operationally into your business? Did, like just observing at the time, like looking back, maybe at the time you didn't realize it, but you kind of saw this big organization how it was run. Do you take any lessons from from uh, those days? Absolutely, I worked for Ernst and Young for five years too. Um, I took a lot of those business experiences and on project management and. Um, traffic management, uh, profitability, you know, really, how do you make money at this? And um, who are the, the people that need to be involved? You know, in the e-myth, we talked about that, you know, as, as the doer, as the graphic designer, I'm sitting there going, well, I can do this better. These, you know, these, my boss is not doing it the right way. I can do it better. I'm going to start a company and do it myself. And then you quit and you start your business and you realize, Oh my God, I'm way over my head. You know, <laughs> like now I know why they didn't do it that way. Um, so you, you take as much as you can. Sure. I want to go to, um, Chris, there's a manufacturing company that you helped and, uh, talk about that a little bit. And you started off kind of with the go to market strategy. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we work with a lot of manufacturing companies and, um, all of them are middle market, small to middle market manufacturing companies. Um, this one stood out 
just from, you had asked me again about a case study. This one stood out just because it meant so much to myself and the team. Uh, I, I met one of the owners of this manufacturing company through uh, some personal hobbies. And he said, hey, I'd really like to talk to you. I think we need marketing. I think we need a new website. And what I didn't know at the time was that this friend of mine and his business partner were very close to going out of business. I didn't learn that till years later. Um, they had actually cashed in their 401ks. And like I mentioned earlier, manufacturing, most of the manufacturing people we work with are really great people. Their team didn't know that they had cashed in their 401ks to cover payroll because they didn't want to lay anybody off. Mm. The bank had called their loan and their capital equipment loan, and they were just really struggling. And here I am, I go in and they need to invest. It was over $100,000 in a website and marketing services over a year's period of time that they couldn't afford. Um, they always paid on time. I mean, you would have never known it. And so years later, uh, we were doing a case study video. And after the video turned off, the owner came to me and he said, Chris, you saved my business. Mm. And I said, well, what do you mean? And uh, he said, you didn't know this. And he told me the whole story about the 401ks and the bank and everything. And uh, he goes, here I am, you know, I got to spend all this money that we don't have. And he goes, it was the best thing we ever did. Um, a year later, he actually terminated services with us. And when I asked him why, he's like, we are getting so many leads now. I can't, I, I don't need you. <laughs> he's like, the, the basis you gave us um, helped propel their growth. And I'm still good friends with the guy today. We were supposed to go fishing just a month ago. That's like a terrible, it's a great way to be fired, but a terrible way to be fired. It is, it is. Right? But, you know, you work with somebody for several years like that. And they, they've referred me to a lot of other companies. And um, yeah. you get the engine going and it runs. But that, I mean, I, that made, you know, that, that when I still think of that, it makes your day. I mean, it's just, uh, you don't realize the impact you can have on somebody by just by doing your job, you know? That's amazing. Because tactically, what were some of the things that you'd recommend others doing that, you know, in that situation, you started this engine of growth and incoming leads. What were some of the things that were critical in that, putting that together? You know, um, one of the challenges in working in the transportation logistics and the manufacturing and distribution like industries is for the most part, they're kind of old school when it comes to marketing and sales. Um, I, would, I would say they're laggards behind many other industries. And um, they've, they've been selling a certain way for a really long time. Usually it's word of mouth, it's relationships. Um, and they typically have, I mean, all the companies, a lot of the companies we work with, it's the same story over and over and over again. So what I'd recommend for companies like them is to really think about how their competition is going to market and that they need to embrace some of the changes that are the way businesses do businesses today. Um, you know, they may have a great reputation. They get a lot of business from word of mouth, but what about when, what happens when that runs out? You know, so they go on these, peaks and valleys of, oh my gosh, we got to lay people off. Oh my gosh, we're too busy. We need to hire people. And with the labor shortages today in both of those markets, it's really difficult. So establishing a very strong value proposition and messaging and really understand what you do and who you do it well for is critical. And then having a website that attracts people and communicates that value proposition is critical. And then the final piece is having a sales process and a CRM system so that you can track your pipeline and you know, your revenue potential and your growth potential. A lot of companies tell me, well, Chris, I, I don't want to get too many leads because I'll be too busy. I mean, I hear that a lot. I heard that this morning. Like, well, wouldn't it be great to pick the best of those leads and pick the most profitable projects as opposed to just being busy? So um, those are the key things. Yeah. 
talk about that mindset for a second. It sounds like there is a, sometimes when you're talking, not you, but anyone to organizations, there's a challenge of showing the importance of marketing. It seems like in, in some of these industries, even more so because they're used to doing things a certain way. How do you explain to them when they're used to doing things? Maybe, oh, we've, it's worked. We've done this for 20 years. Why would we, you know, do this? What, what do you say to those companies to talk about, to get over that hump of the challenge of <clears throat> doing something new, kind of bringing it to, um, to current, I guess. So what I've learned over the years, Jeremy, is you can't have that conversation with somebody unless they're in pain. If, if things are good, you know, and they are just limping along, like I, I have one, one, one uh, business owner tell me, he's like, Chris, I don't want to grow the business. This is third generation. My grandfather started it. Um, I'm now running the company. I just don't want to screw it up on my watch. So I don't want to take any risks. I can't mm -hmm. have that conversation with that person. Um, because they're just not willing to listen because it's just status quo. So, you know, you mentioned it earlier, we typically focus on working with high growth organizations. So these are companies that maybe they're not experiencing high growth, but they want to, and they're committed to it. And that could be, you know, in small companies and large companies, but if they're not in the game to really move the needle, then to be frank, we don't want to work with them. Um, Interesting, I had a conversation this morning. I've, I've had two sales calls this morning. One of them I had a sales call two weeks ago with, and he's, he said, you know, it's a manufacturing company. They're looking to double revenues in five years. And he's like, this is great. I want you to meet the leadership team on the next call. So I called him today to schedule that. And he's like, you know, we decided we're going to do an ERP implementation. It's going to take 12 to 18 months. So here's my approach. And I said, how are you going to double your revenue in five years? Are you really committed to it? If you're going to put off the website and all your marketing for 12 to 18 months, I'm like, it makes zero sense. Like your website today, valid point. <laughs> yeah. Website today is actually hurting your business because it doesn't represent you well. And he, he finally, you know, he said, he's like, Oh my gosh, you're right. Um, which I kind of surprised me <laughs> in a good way. Uh, yeah, so you, the, 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 the company has to be in the mindset that yeah. they need to change, they need to grow. I mean, that's great. I mean, you have to push back a little bit on people, I guess, because they're probably doing what they're used to doing and it's out of their comfort zone. You know, they're probably like, oh, let's just do this first because they're used to, they've done that before. And you're like, well, you said you wanted to do this and that is not accomplishing that. So it's probably out of their comfort zone, I imagine, right? For you to, uh, to say that. Very much so, and you know, especially um, in manufacturing, a lot of them don't have a budget for marketing, unless they're you know a much larger organization. They've never really done marketing, so you know, asking them to put you know a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars in their budget for marketing is a big ask sometimes. So, what do you uh, compare it to in that situation? Do you compare it to it's like you spending a piece, on a piece of equipment? How do you bridge <laughs> that gap? Because that's a big gap, especially even with someone who does spend on marketing. You say, hey, do you want to spend six figures on marketing? It's not like, yes, all the time. And then you have someone who they don't even have a budget for marketing. Yeah, and I, I don't mean to sound coy, but um, yeah, go ahead. I try not to have those conversations anymore. Like, I, I don't want to be in the business of selling marketing. I want to be in the business of selling why Sync Show is the best choice once they've made a decision to do marketing. Mm -hmm. So if companies have not worked with an agency before, first questions I'll ask them are, do you have budget? Um, and are you committed to this? And if, and if the answer is, well, not really, we haven't decided that, I'll immediately give them some general pricing just to see if they're we're in the ballpark and if not then no let's not yeah. let's not waste time here um, yeah because i don't want to i'm not in the business of being an evangelist for why you should do marketing yeah no yeah i mean obviously when you show the value of what they're going to get 
it far outweighs whatever they're going to spend anyway. So I, I can see that, but, but it, it's, it's almost in certain industries, it's, it's change, it's changing someone's paradigm and their mindset a little bit throughout the process of talking to you. I imagine if they go from not used to doing this in a totally different fashion to doing this in a different fashion, and we don't even market, it's just a, it's a big gap, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, um, but no, thanks for sharing that. that. That's helpful. And, and that is helpful to think of, you know, the qualification is like someone's mindset also, which is they have to be kind of growth oriented or, or have a, or experiencing a pain or it's not going to work, you yeah. know? Yep. First of all, Chris, I want to thank you. I have one last question, but um, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, your decades of knowledge and experience. Um, I want to encourage everyone to go to syncshow.com. That's S-Y-N-C show.com. Check out more, especially if you are in the um, industries that I mentioned in the um, logistics, transportation, professional services, manufacturing, check out syncshow.com. Um, so, Chris, Last question. Um, I would love to know, you know, you mentioned the e-myth and a couple of the resources. I'd love to know any um, books or resources out there that you've liked and that you've learned from over the years that other people should check out. Well, so I mentioned who, not how. Um, that one was probably one of the most impactful for me. Um, e-myth is, was great for in my opinion, more for startups. Um, I've referred that to a number of employees that have left to start up their own companies and some people I mentor. I just finished a book called The Comfort Crisis, hmm. which was maybe one of the best books I've read in five years. It's not per se a business book. It's more about um, getting outside and enjoying life and um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of everything, but that was a great book. Hmm. Um, yeah, I'd say those, those are, right. you know, I'll check that about. out. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks, Chris, check out syncshow.com, check out rise Twenty five, check out Spartan insider, and you can check out Scott Anderson too. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate it. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand